Uh, this subject is, has been a big interest of mine. I've tried to translate it into definitely in layman's terms where people have absolute zero knowledge of science. So that's what I've tried to do. In our advanced discipleship study, so this is a very advanced lesson, but we, I've tried to do it in a way where people can grasp it and understand. I've done what I could to prove to you how our Christian belief, how the existence of God is truly based on empirical science. So no reason or logic to pretty much prove it. No philosoph uh, philosoph uh, excuse me, philosophical arguments or historical arguments. I meant to say philosophy, then I was thinking about arguments after that. So none of that, not even biblical, it's only empirical scientific arguments. So that is unheard of, actually, and that is very rare to hear. The reason why I'm doing that kind of teaching in our advanced discipleship studies is how people elevate science to be God. Right. I notice even if you argue philosophically, they still don't listen to you. Even if you argue philosophically, based on so much of elevation of human wisdom and reasoning, they still won't listen. You can give them historical proofs, so they still won't listen, and they certainly won't listen to the Bible. The thing that really uh, binds them is empirical science. It's like they're God or something. So in this lesson, it's purely empirical science, and I've shown you so far, so let's fresh review, all right? We looked at empiricism already, and a lot of its major contributors believed that through this study, there is a God. So I've given you evidences for that. For empiricism, there were a lot of contributors that believed that God exists. Now, another thing is that there were a lot of scientists who came out during the scientific revolution but isn't it strange that a lot of them were based on that time period of people who believed God existed, yep. that Jesus is God. He didn't come out in 1900s or mid-1800s at the height of apostasy and the height of evolution. It was long before that. It was long before. The scientific revolution, revolution was during a time period where a lot of people claimed to be Christians or believed in some Christian beliefs, if not all Christian beliefs. Right. Why? Why did science suddenly pop out during that background, that culture? It's because they believed God existed, and because they believed God existed, then every detail of his creation, his artwork, there must be a reason behind it. They want to study his handiwork, the artist's design, behind every intricate detail. That's what led to empiricism. That's what led to science. So that's why they study molecules. That's why they study trees. That's why they study physics. That's why they studied all these scientific laws today because they believed God existed and they believed it was their duty to study his creation so they can know the mind of the creator. It wasn't because of, from atheism. How about that? Atheism did not contribute to that. In the scientific revolution, empiricism, where they used, remember, observation, that's the bottom line, observation of the five senses of our physical realm, through this empiricism, because of the existence of God, it contributed so much to the scientific revolution. Now, there are three proofs that I've established before for actually hard data science. No Bible verse, just hard data science. Now, there are Bible verses to support them, and I've given them to you. But this is an advanced discipleship lesson concentrating only on empiricism. So the three proofs, remember, was the finite universe. Why is that important? Because it proved that all matter and energy, any substance you can think of in our creation, all had a beginning. So if they all had a beginning, 
then how did we come into existence like that? They can't be eternal, remember that? So if we argue that all substances are finite, they had a beginning somewhere, the question then comes, who put those substances into place? People say, we came from the Big Bang. Then you just simply ask them, where did the Big Bang come from? And then, well, it came from hot plasma. Where the hot plasma came from? Well, it came from gravity. Where did gravity come from? Et cetera, et cetera. And no matter how far back you go, if they hit that original, the very first substance that they reach, that first substance cannot be eternal. That's the bottom line. Everything is finite, okay? So there's no other explanation except to say something supernatural put all those natural substances into play. See that? There's no natural explanation. That's the bottom line. All natural substances have a finite beginning. They can't always be there. So that is strong evidence right there. And the finite universe was proven through the Big Bang Theory model itself. That was surprising. Yeah. Through the Big Bang Theory model itself. The second one was a fine-tuning argument. Fine-tuning argument is basically another word for AKA intelligent design. So, but more specifically, every part in our universe is basically fine-tuned in a way, is built into a way that if it was basically one degree off and another part another degree down, and then another part in the universe is just a little bit off, then you can eradicate life. So that's strong right there. It can't just be something naturally put into place. There has to be basically one intelligent designer who put all of it there at once. That's the idea. The third proof, is DNA, which we're covering. Now it's DNA. All right, let me explain the DNA part, and then after that I'll uh, explain more on empirical arguments that will build up our Christian faith. So uh, this will be on the book, uh, The God Hypothesis, page, uh, The Return of the God Hypothesis, excuse me, page 177. There we go. All right. So he says right here on page 177, so notice that picture there, right? So I'm going to make a long story short. So you see these letters there? Can you so zoom in more excuse me? Can you zoom in farther to find the, the light? Ah, I see what happened here. Okay, I, I did it this way. That was my fault. I should be doing it this way. How's that? All right, thank you. All right. Now, when you look at these letters, that's how our DNA is built. Now, DNA basically picture like volumes and volumes of encyclopedia. So each and every letter in your encyclopedia that's written is built to convey a message, correct? If these letters are randomly put into the encyclopedia, then we're going to get a bunch of jargon, right? When we see these volumes of encyclopedia. But each and every letter in that encyclopedia is intelligently placed into it to build up a word, then to build up a message, then to build up a whole idea, and then to build up volumes and volumes. See that? That's basically our DNA, how it's built. So if certain letters, that's the idea, so they code it by letters, that's how they've done it. If those so-called letters, those codes that they put for each DNA part, is out of place, then you could eradicate life or you could downgrade life. So that's very huge, especially billions of cells within our bodies, right? There's no doubt that this cannot be randomly done. So common sense dictates this is intelligent design. But this is even more detailed because scientists, they, especially evolutionists, they always try to figure out, no, it can be naturally done. It can be randomly done. No, that's not true. This proves right here, this has to be intelligent design, intelligently designed, not just random. Because here's something you need to see. So evolutionists might try to reason out, well, there's just some way that one part of the DNA, it's possible that through chance, through long process of time, there's a certain chemical part 
that might just naturally be attracted to another chemical part uh, or chemical action within the part of our DNA, and then it just builds up to this beautiful DNA and human life eventually. That's what that's how they reason out. Now, naturally, people would just laugh, all right? That ain't even a natural explanation. Naturally, people would laugh about that. But, let's just, but they don't want to believe in God. So let's stick to a naturalistic point of view. Let's stick to an empirical scientific point of view then, assuming that's true. You got a problem here. Further, just as magnetic letters can be combined and recombined in any way, to form various sequences on a metal surface, so too can each of the four bases, adenine, I'm going to uh, butcher uh, pronouncing thymine, guanine, and cytosine, A, T, G, and C. So you saw that picture, right, of those letters, those different letters. So we're going to concentrate only on four here, all right, these four letters. The idea is this. He's trying to, well, before I explain, let me just read the whole thing. Attached to any site on the DNA backbone with equal facility, making all sequences equally probable or improbable. The same type of chemical bond, an N-glycosidic bond, occurs between the bases and the backbone regardless of which base attaches. All four bases are acceptable. None is preferred. Thus, differences in bonding affinity do not determine the arrangement of the bases. In other words, forces of chemical attraction do not account for the information in DNA. So what he's basically pointing out is this, is that you can't say that one certain part of the DNA or letter just somehow naturally, chemically, gets attached to the right part of the DNA part like that. You know why he argues that? He argues that because picture these four letters as if they're magnets, okay? Magnet letters that you put on a magnet uh, surface or a magnet table. The thing is, they, this letter, let's say A, could be magnetically attracted to any random letter you put in there. It's not going to chemically find its way to fit with the right letter. Do you know what I mean? The idea is this letter A, let's say with letter B here, okay? And then there's C and D. If you just put them in a magnetic surface right that, like that, it's not going to go A, B, C, and D. It could, this letter A could go with C or D or B or anything. Why? Because they're all magnet, uh, magnetically attracted to each other. One letter wouldn't happen to find the right letter to go in sequence, and the other letter won't go to the right letter next in sequence like that. Do you know what I mean from that example? So see, DNA, picture this, you got so much coding in there. So like the volumes of encyclopedia, so many letters. If they're all like magnets, and then you threw them in a metal surface, I don't care how you argue, each letter is not going to find the right letter to go next to to produce a huge message. Well, chemically, somehow, if you give a long process of time, you know, it'll find its right way and attach it. No, not if they're all magnetically attracted to each other. See, that's the bottom line, what he's trying to point out here. Here's a problem. There is a good reason for this. If chemical affinities between the constituents in the DNA message text determine the arrangement of the text, such affinities would dramatically, look at this, diminish the capacity of DNA to carry information. So just like an encyclopedia, if each letter was out of place, you can diminish the message. You could ruin the whole encyclopedia. Especially if you number, what, uh, thousands, if not millions? That could convey an information? You think that, that they're all naturally put into place like that? Really? Really? <laughs> Consider what would happen if the individual nucleotide letters in a DNA molecule, molecule did interact by chemical necessity with each other. Let's just suppose that, okay? Suppose every time adenine, A, occurred in a growing genetic sequence, 
it would drag guanine, G, along with it, or every time cytosine, C, appeared, thymine, T, would follow. In that case, the DNA message text would be peppered with repeating sequences as A's followed by G's and C's followed by T's. In other words, even if you were to argue something like that, it still wouldn't convey you the whole complex message. It would only do just two letters or three letters at a time. It wouldn't properly turn it into a full word, let alone a whole message or a whole encyclopedia. Each letter won't find its way in the right place to produce a huge message. That's the bottom line. So this is very powerful, DNA. All you have to do is DNA, and then you believe in intelligent design. That's it. That's the only evidence you need. That's the only evidence you need. So it's extremely powerful. All right, then. Now, I have a problem. Whenever I ta teach this subject because I get excited, I lose my voice. So I better lower my voice, OK? All right. So we see empirical, hard scientific data, guys hard scientific data on DNA, all right? So it demands intelligent design, not natural, all right? Not by itself, not by chance or time. I don't care how much chance or time you put in it. These three things dismiss chance with time. It eliminates something naturally by itself. Natural or necessity. Hard scientific data eliminates these two. So then, what's the only thing? What's the only, there's only one, only one, only one. This is why in your intermediate discipleship class, it was important that you learn that, which I taught you about uh, proving the existence of God as you argue with atheists. So I'm not sure if that was taught in intermediate discipleship, but I mentioned about there are only four causes to how we all existed, all right? The only four causes, and one of them is this one, the other one is this one, and then the third one was, it's all a lie, it's a delusion, which no one's going to follow. And the last one is intelligent design. There are only four. There's no other way around it. No other way around it. Okay. So then, hard data science proves every single time that this is the best option. Not this and not this. I mean, what else are you going to say with DNA, with all those letters? It, it's, it put it by itself? We've established the fact no stinking way. There's no doubt somebody deliberately put them all into place like that. Absolutely impossible where it could do it by itself. That's natural necessity or with chance and time. Absolutely impossible. Hard, empirical, scientific data and observation. Everyday observation, that's empiricism, right? Everyday observation from what we look at in our physical realm, if you get something like this, from our experience, we say somebody did it. Some intelligence was behind it that designed or put it into place. So that's empirical, scientific, hard data. All right, now... Because of this, that's the reason why the next thing that I want to cover, oh boy, I want to cover Bayesian calculus, but I don't know if I'll reach that part. So we'll see, we'll see if we can reach there soon. I want to get into quantum mechanics too, so hopefully I'll get there. So let me say this quickly. The next part that we could see is that there are agnostic, atheists and evolutionists, scientists, who are arguing that they should open up a new scientific hypothesis. And that's not evolution th through by itself, but rather intelligent design. Believe it or not. So 
who are arguing now, who are proposing basically the God hypothesis that we've always talked about. What scientific hypothesis would explain the origin of life in our universe? Not evolution by itself through natural means. You have to put an intelligent design there, or you can call it God, however way you want. So here are some examples, actually. Uh, let me go back here. This is from the God Hypothesis book, Return of the God Hypothesis, page 108. Now, this is from uh, Sandage, and he's a very uh, big authority when it comes to science. Sandage described his own internal struggle to reconcile his commitment to a reductionistic and materialistic philosophy of science with his growing convictions that something beyond the strictly material must have played a role in bringing the universe into existence. <laughs> he explained that although he did not think that scientific evidence could prove God's existence, he did, he did think that new discoveries in cosmology and physics had lent unexpected credibility and support to theistic belief. He continued, I now have to go from a stance as a complete materialistic rational scientist and say this supernatural event. How about that? Which is what we always argued, right? How we came to be is we came out supernaturally. To me, gives at least some credence to my belief that there is what? Some design put in the universe. See, they're open to intelligent design. I cannot with certainty say that. Yeah, of course he can't. <laughs> yeah, of course he can't, you know, lest he be put out of the synagogue, right? As the Bible says. What now do I do? I, what now do I do? I know. What now do I do? Simple. Get saved in Jesus Christ. But see, when you love your synagogue so much with your uh, scientific rabbis, who are, who are ready to stone you to death through CNBC and John Oliver programs and those comedian channels, then that's the reason why you can't do anything about it. You're in trouble. That's why you ask yourself, what do I do now? I am convinced that there is some order in the universe. Oh, I think all scientists at the deepest level are so startled by what they see in the miraculousness of the interconnection of things in their field. They that they at least have wondered why it is this way. How about that? Here's another one. This is from uh, another scientific authority, Robert Jastrow of the Goddard Space Institute. He was a religiously agnostic Jewish scientist. Oh, all right then. What did he say here? The last part of the paragraph, he said that uh, in a mem... Memorable conclusion to his book, Jastrow observed that the discovery of a definite cosmic beginning. So remember the finite universe argument, right? That I pointed out as the first empirical proof. Remember that? All right. So this is why he came, opened up to intelligent design. Is an exceedingly strange development, unexpected by all but the theologians. Did you hear that? This scientist said, this is surprising to us scientists except the theologians. That's big. You know why? Theologians already knew the universe is finite. It did have a beginning. God had to put it into place or something intelligent or supernatural. Something outside of the natural realm had to put the natural into place. They have always accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The development is an unexpected because science has had such extraordinary success in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Would you believe that? That's huge. That's really huge there. Oh, man. So then you can be assured that what you have is real. All right, now here's Professor Dean Kenyon. He was an authority on chemical evolutionary theory. Okay, so this guy knows about the actual chemical stuff. 
genetics, etc., on how life was formed. And the scientific study of the origin of life. He held a PhD in biophysics from Stanford, had done research at NASA, and had published numerous scientific papers on the origin of life. Skipping down, in Biochemical Predestination, Kenyon and his co-author, Gary Steinman, argued that life might have arisen as crucial protein molecules, first self-organized without assistance from DNA, as a result of purely natural, only natural forces of chemical attraction between the smaller amino acid subunits out of which proteins are made. Oh, whoop de doo But then here's the problem right here. Yet by the late 1970s, Kenyon himself began to question the plausibility of his own theory. Why? Experiments increasingly contradicted the idea that functional proteins could have assembled themselves from their amino acid building blocks without pre-existing genetic information in DNA directing the process. In other words, somebody else already had to put that genetic information in the DNA to begin with so that the DNA processes could naturally go smoothly. See, somebody already had to put it into place. That's the idea. It couldn't just do it by itself. This forced Kenyon to reconsider the importance of DNA for building proteins and to search for an explanation for the origin of the information it contained. As he studied the structure of the DNA molecule more, Kenyon realized that the information in it could not have self-organized. To say otherwise would be like saying a newspaper headline might arise as a result of the chemical attraction between <laughs> ink and paper. In Dallas, Kenyon publicly and dramatically repudiated his theory of biochemical predestination. So he renounced, basically, he renounced that DNA or any particles in life or parts in life that they could have just constructed by itself. He also expressed misgivings about other chemical evolutionary theories and argued that the presence of information in the DNA molecule defied explanation by all current naturalistic theories of the origin of life, not just his own. Kenyon wasn't the only scientist on the panel who had come to this conclusion. A year before the conference in 1984, chemist Charles Thaxton, polymer scientist Walter Bradley, and geochemist Roger Olson published a book challenging the current chemical evolutionary theories of the origin of life. The book titled, The Mystery of Life's Origins, of Life's Origin. How about that? So notice right here, there are atheists, agnostic, and evolutionists. Scientists, all uh, scientific big name authorities who are recognizing, opening up to, this cannot just happen by itself. There must be something else behind it who put it into place. Now, let's uh, destroy the chance argument, okay? How often have they used chance, 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 by chance, you know? They don't live their life by chances, all right? Trust me, all right? No one would. They want hard scientific data. That's how they live by, right? Wouldn't anyone would? Who goes by chances? They want strong scientific data to live by. That's how you and I live, right? So why don't we do that rather than by chance, huh? Okay, but anyway, let's go by strictly hard scientific data. And so far, I've constantly done that. I've constantly done that. Uh, let's just leave this here. That way we can follow along. The next thing I want to cover is chance. So basically, they argue that, you know, basically this substance, all right, so I use substance very loosely, okay, I know that you can put other scientific words for it, but just call it substance, all right, that's basically all manner and energy or anything you can think of in our universe, in our creation. So let's say this substance right here, through a long process of time, it could eventually produce, da 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 da, da hey, but you know, people don't even believe in science, so they wonder if they're this, or they're like this, or you know, they're like in between, or so you know, they're not even scientists anymore. They're in la la land. Like they've always done at the beginning anyway, all right? But besides that, the bottom line is that this is supposed to be possible, 
if you give it long periods of time, through long periods of time, it's possible that certain substances, that they'll naturally meet the right substance and then combine and then evolve into something higher, and then that higher thing, through long process of time, will come out to what we are today. But here's the problem. Nobel laureate Christian de Duvet, a leading origin of life biochemist until the his death in 2013, this is page 176, categorically rejected the chance hypothesis. So he rejected that scientific hypothesis of chance. Why? Precisely because he judged the, nece the necessary fortuitous convergence of events implausible in the extreme. In a memorable passage in his 1995 article, The Beginnings of Life on Earth, De Duvet made explicit the logic by which he rejected the chance hypothesis. As he put it, quote, a single, freak, highly improbable event can conceivably happen. Many highly improbable events, drawing a winning lottery number or the distribution of playing cards in a hand of bridge, happen all the time, but a string of improbable events, drawing the same lottery number twice, just even twice, or the same bridge hand twi twice in a row, does not happen what? Naturally. This is from leading origin of life biochemist. He gave you something very eye-opening, all right? I don't know if you caught that. What is this? He said, he specifically said, this is not natural. That's key, natural. Wait a minute, what are scientists trying to do to prove how we came to be? Naturalistic explanations, naturalism, natural. Isn't this a contradiction? Yeah. Duh. These are PhD people we're talking about here. See that? This don't make sense. They just contradicted themselves. So scientifically, see that? We're more natural then. Believe it or not, yeah. Christians reject naturalism. To be quite honest, we're more natural than you. Because naturally, we know that if something powerful, something outside of it, something intelligent put it into place, then it will happen. That's what we know. You see a car, something outside of it, not the car's chemical processes by itself produce the car. Same thing with anything in life. Same thing with anything in life that you see nowadays. Any created thing that you see, created object that you see nowadays, we don't say it naturally happened by itself. Something outside of it that had some intelligence or a design put into it is what created it. <laughs> when you don't explain that way, then you're in a not, uh, unnatural explanation. So when they tell you that, through long process of time, the substance can basically form by itself and stuff like that. That's a not, that's a non-naturalistic explanation. That's outside of science. Here's another weakness with the chance argument. Okay, so then one, we see that it's already not natural. All right, they contradicted themselves. Here's the second problem with the chance argument. Now this is from a... Uh, Mathematician and philosopher. So this guy is a big authority then. He was actually agnostic. He was agnostic. So he wasn't a theist. But then later on, it forced him more and more into theism when he studied the chance and probability. This is from page uh, 157. This is from the mathematician and philosopher William Dembski. He mentioned this, has developed a theory about how we detect the activity of intelligent agents and the effects they leave behind. His theory helps explain why the fine-tuning evidence suggests design to so many physicists. It also reinforces the conclusion that the fine-tuning of the laws, constants, and initial conditions of the universe does indeed point to a designing mind. In his groundbreaking book, The Design Inference, Dembski explicated the criteria by which rational agents recognize the effects of other rational agents and distinguish them from the effects of unintelligent natural causes. This is what he says, according to Dembski, systems, sequences, or events that exhibit two characteristics at the same time, extreme improbability, 
and a special kind of pattern called a specification. Indicate prior intelligent activity. According to Dembski, extremely improbable events that also exhibit an independently recognizable pattern or set of functional requirements, what he calls a specification, invariably, see that? Always result from intelligent causes, not chance or physical chemical laws. That's big. So then uh, he brings uh, several examples, and what I'll do is, uh, you can just read that if you doubt me, but to save time, because I don't have much time, and because uh, I want to make it easy for people to understand, I'll explain it. Okay, so specification. The idea is this. If you see some kind of thing, okay, substance or action, okay? So anything in life that's improbable. If you see anything in life that improbably happened, the idea behind it is it couldn't just have happened by itself. Somebody conjured it up, right? So let's say that uh, you got uh, money in your wallet, okay? And then let's say you got uh, safe code uh, passwords in your computer. Everything's locked up foolproof, all right? There's no way, no way that uh, it's going to go away or something. But all of a sudden, you know, all the important information that you have is gone from your computer. Now, obviously, you're not going to say it just did it by itself. What you're going to assume is that there's someone, that there's some intelligent design behind it. The simple answer, you got hacked. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the thing. You're not going to say, well, the computer just somehow let, let loose a code and then something, this happened and go into quantum mechanics to go through La La Land and explain any possible theory on how you could have lost it. No, common sense from people. If you see an improbable event happening, then you automatically assume somebody did this. That's the idea. But this is stronger when you add an independently recognizable pattern. And it is even more so when it has Requirements, functional requirements. What does that mean? What that means is this. From independent experience, from what you saw before, if, it mat if your independent experience matches with what happened with that improbable event or thing or whatever occurred, if there's an independent experience that matched with that, that proves even more so intelligent design, where somebody did it. But you add that with, okay, there are certain requirements needed for this thing to happen, for this thing to work. Like there's a lot of things that require it for this thing to happen or to work. More so, somebody did it. More so intelligent design, okay? If you look at, and he brings up examples of uh, Mount Rushmore, and then you see the faces of the presidents, you're not going to assume that uh, through long process of time, through rain, yeah. and then uh, all the scientific processes working, that those faces came out in that intric intricate detail. No. Pro why? Because one, that's improbable, okay? Number two, it builds up even more. From prior independent experience, when you see those faces, you've seen other people's artworks that matched up with those faces on the mountain. And then add to that, to have a nose, it needs a requirement of a measurement of this precise measure, and then it has to be shaped in this precise measure, followed by where every, uh, you gotta make sure it's in the right distance, followed by, see that? You add so many requirements that will work, that will turn into that face, no stinking way it naturally happened. One thing, if uh, let's say you see letters scattered all over the floor, okay? A little toddler was playing with the letters and then the letters were scattered all over the floor. I mean, good chance that you might see the letter cat, C-A-T, randomly 
uh, if you throw in a bunch of letters. But good luck if it says, uh, Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss. No random way is that happening. Why? Too many functional requirements. All right? So when you add this, this proves intelligent design. So this is a, so notice right here, we already have scientific mathematical explanations. Wow. That's hard data. Hard data so far. Hard data. How are you going to go around that? All right, now, now let's go to quantum mechanics. Yay, okay. Or gravity first, let's see, okay. Okay, come on, get there, get there, get there, all right. All right, let's go to, first of all, the gravity argument, okay. All right, how many of you heard Stephen Hawking give the famous statement, we don't need God because gravity created everything, right? Yeah, we all heard that before. You know, this is so funny. All right, you won't believe how simple it is to debunk that argument. You know how to do it? Okay. So let me read it, and then uh, I'll show you, okay? He mentions right here, uh, let's see if uh, the next page will also show it. Uh, no, it won't show it the next page, so I'm going to have to read just this part, and then I'll explain it. Mass energy and an infinitely strong gravitational field since at the singularity, so page 117, the mass energy density and the strength of the gravitational field would also have approached affinity. Even so, the singularity theorems do not permit one to posit mass energy or a gravitational field as an eternal self-existing entity since prior to the singularity. This is important. Neither time nor space existed in our universe. And without space, mass energy, that includes and a corresponding gravitational field, would have no place to reside. Uh, let's keep reading here. Ah, la, 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 la. In other words, however much mass energy existed from the beginning of the universe, it had to arise with the beginning of time and space. Both of which began what? A finite time ago. Thus, a spatial or temporal singularity prevents, as Davies noted, any physical reason, reasoning about a prior state of the universe through such an extremity, and thus that extremity or singularity does mark the beginning of the physical universe itself. He mentions right here, Moreover, insofar as the space-time singularity marks the point of origin of the universe from nothing physical, cosmological models based on solutions to the field equations of general relativity seem strangely reminiscent of what theologians long describe in doctrinal terms as creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. Some of you may have heard that in Bible study class before. Notice this is what Hawking said. Stephen Hawking himself, the last underlying portion here. The actual point of creation, the singularity, is outside the presently known laws of physics. Okay, so let me explain right here. Going back, I can't believe I didn't have the picture of that, uh, of that other uh, reading. That would have been better. But anyway, you can look at that... Uh, you can look at those pages and the surrounding ones, and then you'll see what I mean. But the idea is this. Remember the finite universe argument we argued before? Okay, so let's go back there. What proves uh, the God hypothesis? We mentioned the first proof is the finite universe. Why? Because scientists discovered that our universe is expanding, right? From their point of view, the universe is expanding. That's why they argue Big Bang, which then, uh, which shows that some point of origin, there was some kind of big action that took place and then spread throughout the whole universe. Now, you and I already can guess that is God spoke the world into existence. But anyway, 
we're not going to go to Bible, uh, Bible conc biblical conclusions here. Let's just stick to the empirical science stuff. So the idea is this. This is our universe, right? And then here's Earth. So then you, all you have to do to find the origin of everything is to go backwards, right? The universe keeps expanding, expanding, expanding. So all we have to do is just go backwards then. So then we can go backwards in time and find the point of origin. So by going backwards, they reach what they call a point of singularity. This is what they call it. Now this is uh, Hawking's argument. Gravity is what created everything. Oh, but here's the problem right here. When you do the measurements of singularity right there and gravity for it to work, the law of gravity to work itself, right? But here's the problem here. In this singularity, they say no space. OK, no space. Then how can this even create you? Because from here we get space. But within this point, no space. But gravity to work, it needs space. Besides, matter and energy, they said, had a beginning. You can't argue eternal gravity, which needs the matter and energy. You can't do that. You just said matter and energy had a beginning, one. And number two, there's no space right here. So then gravity needs space to do its work. You proved your argument. Gravity created us all. Wonderful. No, you just proved how unintelli more unintelligent you are. So they're stuck right here. The scientists are stuck. This is truly then, look at this. This is truly nothing. This is truly nothing. You can't give natural explanations right here, some natural substance, natural element. No matter and energy had a beginning right here. And they're not eternal. So what are you going to do? What can, put, what can put something from nothing then? Some power then. You don't want to call it God. Fine. Then what are you going to call it? Don't give it a naturalistic term because you can't. Isn't that funny? So there's nothing you can do about this except to argue the God hypothesis. That would make the most sense. It makes the most sense to argue that a God literally created everything out of nothing. That's the only explanation how you can put it all into place. And don't forget, when all this came from nothing, it was fine-tuned. In other words, it was put in place the right place. Now, what are you going to say? After that, <laughs> there's no doubt, intelligent design. This is a huge problem uh, for the atheist agnostics and evolutionists. You have to argue the God hypothesis at this point. No doubt about that. So the Bible proves itself every single time. So we see right here that gravity... And just like everything else had a beginning. Ah, I want to mention this part. This is important. So what, what scientists will try to do is, no, 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 gravity is eternal. All right? So then they'll use uh, math to prove that gravity, when we mathematically calculate the stuff, it can actually be infinity. You know what the simple debunking to that is? The simple debunking to that is, so are you eternal. What were you talking about? Soul? That doesn't mean you never had a beginning. You thought about that? What about angels? Aren't they eternal? That don't mean it didn't have a beginning. What about hell? Isn't it eternal? That doesn't mean it never had a beginning. So just because you can calculate something to have an eternal lifespan doesn't prove you got rid of a beginning. Use your head. But here's the funny thing, okay? The funny thing behind it is, it still doesn't change the fact, even if you mathematically uh, calculate all this 
to, oh, it equals infinity. How do you not know that it had a beginning and then from there it has an infinite lifespan after that? How do you not know? And that is scientifically proven that everything had a what? Singularity. Scientific, everything had a beginning. Even, even gravity, you're going to have to put that. Why? Because you need space, matter, and energy and all that. What are you going to do, man? Just believe in God. Why won't somebody want to get saved after that? All right? Now, notice I use complete empiricism here. Hard scientific data. Now, I don't know why you won't get saved after that. Too stubborn. All right. How many of you Christians now feel like, wow, man, my belief is scientifically proven? You know who, what you're going up against if you doubt in God? You're going against hard scientific data, Christian. Let that swim over your head, huh? How about that? Here's another uh, flaw to the argument. I can't get into quantum mechanics. Uh, oh, no, actually, I can. Quantum mechanics here. Okay. So quantum mechanics, so I can only cover a portion of this. Agnostic atheist scientists, like I told you before, they try to use math to prove how our universe came into existence, right? So gravity is one of their gods. It's one of their elements. They, they need that so much. They need gravity so much. They need that force. They realize that gravity is what they consider to be a force. Kind of like God of forces, right, at the book of Daniel. But anyway, you know, it's one of their gods. Uh, now I'm getting into weird stuff. Let's just stick to science, okay? So in science, what they claim, all right? So I don't believe everything that they claim either, okay? So, but I'm just going by their terminologies, their playing field in science to prove a point. So I don't want some Bible believers to get upset at me either, okay? Let's return to the main point. Through quantum mechanics, and then they use all kinds of math to prove how our universe came into being, and then gravity is one of the big keys there. The laws of physics is necessary for their math and quantum mechanics, okay? Now notice I said laws of physics. There is a problem to say that how did the... What caused our universe? Oh, it's the laws of physics. That's actually laughable. That doesn't make sense. Now, for people on the surface, they might think, uh, no, actually it makes sense. No, it doesn't make sense. I'll explain the flaw here, okay? So let's use this one, okay, real quickly. It's called a category, uh, page 370. It's a, called a category mistake, okay? And then let's explain this. To see why, consider the following illustration. If one billiard ball of some given mass bashes into another billiard ball, the law of conservation of momentum accurately describes the interaction. It will even allow us to make predictions about, for example, the change in velocity of the second ball. If we know the masses of the two balls and the velocity of the first ball as required by the equation describing momentum exchange. Physicists write the law of momentum conservation as follows. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I ain't reading that. Nevertheless, the equation, look at this, describing that interaction, the law of conservation of momentum, does not cause the second ball to move. Why? Because the cause of the movement of the second ball is the movement of the first ball. The cause of the second ball's movement is an antecedent event, the prior movement of the first ball coming into contact with the second. The law simply describes that interaction. That's the key. The laws of physics simply describe. They don't cause. He says right here, the laws of physics describe the interactions of things, matter and energy, that already exist within space and time. Okay, let me break it down even more into plainer English, okay, through that example. What's he trying to, uh, what's he trying to point out here? Be uh, basically, here's, uh, oops. My bad. Da, da, da. Okay. This is their flaw. Let me write it out that you get it. Laws of physics. See the scientific term? See that? Okay. Quantum mechanics. All right. It comes from there. Also, 
what comes from there is math. See that? So in quantum mechanics that they use to prove that, here's one example, gravity created the universe, OK? That's the idea, they'll say. All right, what's the flaw? Look at the underlying portions here. Laws of physics do not cause things to happen. Math does not cause things to happen. Why was math conjured up? Why is laws of physics conjured up? Because people are describing the interaction of things. So here's the idea, OK? So let's say here's a substance, right? And then here's substance one, and then substance two. And then they start doing some action. So pay attention to this. So we see substance interacting with each other, correct? Substances interacting with each other, correct? So just think of common sense examples where you can think of one substance and another substance interacting with each other, OK? Let's say, God forbid this would happen, but let's say that one of the members over here got bitter at somebody else. They're just so mad at that person. And then they just took out a knife and then stabbed the body, and then the person died, OK? What would you describe? What would you describe person one Stabbing person two, and that interaction of stabbing. What would you call that? Murder, right? So is what murder caused that thing to happen? Murder didn't do that. I'll tell you what did. The first guy who grabbed the knife, see, substance one, and then he stabbed that person. That's a description. It's not what caused, murder didn't cause that to happen. Murder is just a description of substances interacting. Yeah. What your job is to find what caused it, not describing it. You want to find the origin of the universe? You can't just describe substances interacting with each other. See that? You got to find an, uh, an actual cause to all this. So you can't just say because uh, person one, put a knife to person two, that murder happened. And that's how you find the cause. No, you got to find out the first person, what the person's name is, and what actually happened in everything. <laughs> they See, the point is, scientists don't even go here. All they do is stay right here. That's the laws of physics. See that? You give it a name, law of gravity. Gravity, don't just make it happen. Gravity is described that way because of certain substances that interact with each other. And then you described it to be gravity. Oh my goodness, see? Okay, here's another example, all right? I preach a sermon, all right? And then uh, one person, uh, let's say that there are uh, 50 people, okay? One person walks out mad after preaching, all right? Subtract that, it's 49, right? All right, so math caused the person to walk out of the church service. Is that correct? Uh, let me, no, no, let's be more specific. Subtraction is what caused that person to walk out of my service, right? So I'll blame subtraction. No, fool, you describe, math is used to describe what happened. One person walked out of the service, so it equals 49, all right? That didn't cause it. I'll tell you what caused it, something in my message. But we have to find the cause, see that? You have to find that cause on, on that substance that interacted. Scientists don't even go here. They just stick to here. This is what caused this. So you know what that is? Like evolutionists have always done, circular reasoning. See that? <laughs> Funny. Laws of physics uh, is what caused things to happen, is what created our universe. You're funny, man. 
You're too funny. No, that's just a description. You're just sticking to here and making it so more complicated in finer detail, okay? That's what you're doing, all right? You're not actually going to the cause and finding out what happened. So notice right here, the, the amateur argument. S laws of physics created our universe. No, fallacy. Math created our universe. Fallacy. Those are descriptions. And I'll keep debunking quantum uh, mechanics too, through their inflationary cosmology, all right? Bubble universes, the universe expands, contracts, and all that kind of good stuff. So I'll get into that one. I'll expand more on inference to the best explanation as well, using I think what they call abductive inferences for confirmation hypotheses. And then we'll come to Bayesian probability calculus. Uh, that's going to be really fun and interesting. Now, these uh, complicated terms might go, oh man, I'm not going to get it. But you notice how I try to translate it into simplicity? So it makes it fun now, see? It makes it fun. So then I translated it where you can see the bogus behind the scientists now. That's what I've proven. All right. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to our hearers. Made them more convinced that what we have is scientific truth, hard data, and that you are real, Father. Creation screams it out that there is a God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.